Welcome, everyone. Radio Dead Air, Dead Q&A. Very, very late, screwy issues with Ustream and also issues with Mike's camera. Hooray, we're having fun tonight. We haven't even gotten to the questions yet. If you would like to send questions to the two of us who can't seem to do anything fucking right with computers tonight. It's one of those nights. Send it to requests at radio.air.com. We will attempt to answer it for you. But first, let's get to a little bit of news. This was kind of a big week for, for well, developers. Remember Steve Ballmer? Developers, developers, developers! Yep. It's kind of funny that something big for developers in Windows happens after Steve Ballmer has long left the company. The, this is probably one of the most cumbersome... Microsoft is notorious for cumbersome titles on things. This is probably the most cumbersome way of, of explaining this to people. Windows 10 has the Windows 10 Anniversary Update. The Windows 10 Anniversary Update. Now, a normal person hearing that might think, oh, Windows 10 has been out for a year? No. But that's not what it is. It's, it's the, I think, what is it, 25th anniversary, 30th anniversary of Windows, something like that? Something like that. But they got an anniversary update. And, but, and while the naming situation at Microsoft has not improved, one thing, big thing came out. Windows 10 now supports Linux Bash. Yes. Now, most of you are, are sitting there going, what? What is that? Okay, so the short version of what Bash is, and sure Nash is bringing it up on the screen, Nash, uh, Bash is a shell system. Think command prompt. Those of you who know what a command prompt is for Linux, but it's a little bit more robust than that. You can do all sorts of scripting in it that you can't necessarily do from a C prompt in Windows. And scripting is very critical for two big people. One is uh, system operators who manage servers. Servers, most every server on the internet, as much as Microsoft would like to make Windows Server a thing, stop trying to make Windows Server a thing. It's not going to be a thing, Microsoft. As much as Microsoft would like Windows Server to dominate the market, there is one server software that kind of dominates everything, and that's Apache. Apache yep. is Unix-based. Unix is Linux. Linux is Unix. They're not, except they are, except they're not. But what it comes down to is, for the first time ever, system operators can code natively in Windows. They can access the Windows file system via the Bash uh, shell. They can do all sorts of things. The other big one, and this is kind of funny, while many, many would think that Windows 10 having Bash would be a shot across the bow for Linux, it's actually a shot across the bow for Apple. Over the past decade, Apple being, since it went to the Mac, what was it, OS 10? Started. I think that's yeah. what it was. When Mac released the first iteration of OS X, it incorporated a Unix underpinning into the Mac OS. And this was big, this was a big deal for developers back then because it allowed them to code applications natively in Mac OS. They could use a, a Linux shell and scripts and all sorts of important things that are necessary for developing applications. Now, for Windows to make a native uh, Bash shell option for developers means they can do all that kind of stuff without having to dual boot into Linux, without having to open up a virtual machine of Linux and Windows. They can natively code in Windows. This, when so that, I will say Microsoft has specifically said 
this is for developers only. Regular users shouldn't be using this, but there'll be plenty of people who do. Regular users will figure out how to get all of Ubuntu working on Windows. Regular users will, get, they will get the entire uh, Mint desktop, or what is it, GNOME, they'll get the entire GNOME desktop. They will get all that shit running. They don't give a fuck. They do not give a fuck. But this is a big deal for developers. Windows needs, desperately needs developers right now. If you go to the Windows 10 Windows App Store. It's empty. It is empty as shit. The cupboard is bare, son. And what every platform needs is a killer app. Windows has never, in terms of their app store, never really been able to compete with the likes of Google and Apple on this regard. Yeah. I mean, yes, they've got their office suite, but that's not something that no one goes out and says, I need to get me some of that Windows because of Office. And not only that, their office suite is hella expensive when most people can get by just fine with Google Apps, which is free. I mean, if, you, if you're just a regular person and you want to, you know, use your, to if you want to use um, Office on your machine, you got to pay out the ass for that shit. Most people just fire up Google Apps. They don't have to worry about it anymore. Yeah. I mean, I only paid, paid $10 for my office suite, but that's because I got it to work. So what this is all about is this is about drawing in developers from Mac OS, trying to lure them over to Windows, trying to fill out that app store. This, this is actually what's left over um, the underpinnings Windows was attempting for a while with Project Astoria. Windows 10 was originally supposed to run Android apps. There was going to be a cross-platform. Android apps were going to be compatible with Windows 10. They That's dumped by the wayside. Yeah, they dumped that. But this is what's left over. This bash shell. This these were the underpinnings of Project Astoria. So this is what's left. They are trying desperately to get developers over. Will this work? A lot of people are excited about it. But we're just gonna have to see in the long run if this does uh, anything. Yeah. <laughs> So. There'll be some stuff that's ported over. There'll be a handful of popular apps that make it, whether any of those count as killer enough to get, you know, a foot in the door and start building things up. Who knows? It'll probably take a couple of years for that to, to, to fall out and say whether or not it worked. Well, let's, let's move along. It's time for a cord cutting update. Um, first, it was HBO. Then it was Showtime. Now it's Stars. Stars now has their own streaming service that does not require a cable subscription. Interesting. <clears throat> the Stars have anything worth watching yet? They have Ash vs. Evil Dead. Okay, so that's one show. And they have behind the scenes of Ash vs. Evil Dead. So it's maybe one and a quarter shows. <laughs> Yeah, I know. Um, they have out, everybody says Outlander's great, but they have Outlander, I guess, whatever that is. Um, there should have been only one. Wait, wrong. Sorry. Wrong thing. Wrong thing. This is this isn't about immortals. It's about time travel. But still Scots. But still Scottish. Yes. Um, well, to be fair, we don't know if it's about immortals yet. There could be immortals. If they've got time travel, why not? The topic's over here, Mike. Topic's over here. You're over here. We need you over here. Sure, sure. Thank you very much. Um, so what does this all mean? It means that people in the cable industry are having a conniption fit at this point. Oh, yeah. When HBO did it, it was just a matter of time before the other... Big names followed suit. In fact, confusingly, CBS has their own streaming service, even though ostensibly you should be able to get CBS over an antenna. Yeah, but if not everything that's on the antenna is available. Excuse me, not everything that's on the streaming service is available through the antenna. Which is bullshit. That is solid gold bullshit. 
they just made a couple shows that are streaming only. Just Star Trek. Fuck you. Put Star Trek on the TV where it belongs. Fuck you. So what all this means in the long run is cable, which has been beholden to their bundles, which they for if you get a cable bundle. You get all kinds of stuff you don't necessarily want. You'll maybe like never watch. ESPN 1 through 9. Fox News. C-SPAN. I've watched C-SPAN before. <laughs> because I couldn't sleep. <laughs> C-SPAN will put you right the fuck out. C-SPAN is the best cure for insomnia. You just get somebody just droning on and on well, about line item budget appropriations and boom! There have, there have been times they've gone uh, briefly, I guess, to have done British uh, politics on C-SPAN. And that's that's different. That's, they'll call each other a cunt right on the air. They don't care. They're fucked up. Um, <laughs> oh, the House of Parliament. Um... Anyway, back to the point, Nash. Come back to the point. Come on back. Come on back. All right. The point here is that the whole bundle model of cable might be blinkering out. Yeah. Now, a big powerful block that has kept the bundles together has been sports networks, who have had a lot of leverage to negotiate with cable saying, look, if you're going to broadcast our games... We require to be on these on in front of the, on these services, whether people want us there or not. And they've had a lot of leverage in that regard. Now, lots of people want a cheaper cable cable bill. <clears throat> they don't necessarily want all all that stuff. They just maybe want Game of Thrones. They want some stuff on Showtime. Whatever's on what's on Showtime? House of Lies. I think that's about it. Um. So this means cable now has competition from the cable services it's already been offering. And a sneaky thing has been happening on Amazon's side. Lots of people have been saying, well, I don't want to have to pay all these different subscriptions, all these different logins, all these different places. If you check Amazon streaming video, they actually consolidate. They, they've worked with HBO, Showtime, Stars. They've actually consolidated all those subscriptions into Amazon. So you can pay Amazon all through one certain... Now, they still, it's still an extra cost per channel. But you can pay Amazon, consolidate it together, almost like, like a cable service. That's kind of... Hmm... A lot more convenient. A lot more convenient. However, HBO is $15 a month. Showtime is $10.99 a month. Stars is $8.99 a month. Now, obviously, the more of these come out, the prices will start getting a bit more competitive, I'm sure. But what will does this mean that Amazon is going to step up and act as competition to Charter and Comcast and, and Time Warner? That'd be neat. That'd be neat, but would it be good? Well, Google's already acting as competition. <clears throat> they just need to get to more cities. Well, Google is acting as competition in terms of the content, prov uh, in terms of content delivery, in terms of content creation and providing. Amazon's yeah, now now taking the other side of it by consolidating. They say, "Hey, you just stop right here. We'll put all your stuff together for one low price." They might even have start offering deals. And, you know, price, if you get all to, all through all of these streaming services together, we'll give you a cut rate. Will this be cost competitive with cable in the long run? It may be. How much do you get cable television anymore? Uh, yes, but it's included in my rent. So. Oh, so you don't know how much you pay. No, I don't know. I don't know hardly anyone who has cable TV anymore. It's so weird. What what do, what do people pay for cable television? Sir? I know I pay like a hundred for my internet service because I have super ass upload. Be nice if it worked right reliably, but 
It's working like right by your end. It's a uh, fucking new stream. Um, it, it's it's a matter of whether this will be cost effective in the long run. It may be, and this may be another case of disruptive technology in terms of cable. It's just I don't think cable was quite expecting this this at too brutus behavior from you know their their prime money makers cuz before now the only place you could go if you wanted to see hbo shows was you actually you had to pirate it or you could go to your cable well, i think given the number of feuds that have gone on between cable companies and content providers over the last several years of where there's been blackouts because you know some want, someone wants more money. The other person says, no, we should actually yeah. have less money. Um, it's not surprising to me that people are going, let's roll our own. You know, the providers are going, Cutting we out don't the need them now. The infrastructure's in place. Okay. Yeah. I, the, the problem with middlemen is that most of the world are middlemen. and They don't like being cut out. They are going to go down kicking and screaming. So I expect... I, I'm pretty sure this is going to end up being in front of the FCC at some point. Someone is going to complain. Someone is going to sue. And this is going to go up in front of the FCC. So you can keep it maybe like a year, a year or two from now. Keep your eyes open. But, but over what? I, I can honestly imagine with a straight face, someone like Comcast going up in front of the FCC and trying to claim that Amazon is acting as a cable provider and needs to be regulated like one. Okay. I yeah. can honestly, with this, it don't hold water for shit, but I can see them doing it. Concerning some of the other shit they've tried to, to run past. I mean, for fuck's sake, they're assholes. Um, last one tonight. This is this is good for any. Speaking of Amazon again, this is good. Yeah, this is good for anyone who needs cables. For not the cable television kind of cable, the wire kind of cable. <clears throat> if you go to a store like Best Buy to buy, say, a simple USB cable, USB cable, you will probably pay a fifty to seventy percent markup on a piece of wire. Even more if it says monster on it. <laughs> yeah, even more if it says monster on it. So. Me and most people I know who are sick and tired of that shit no longer purchase cables in stores. We buy them online from places like... Unless I have an immediate need for it. Well, yeah, yeah. That, that's the emergency. That's what, like, shit, shit, shit. Who's got one? You go down, you pay $20 oh. for a three-foot USB cable, which is bullshit. Well... Um, well, if you're like me, you'll go to some place like Amazon or Newegg and you'll get them much, much cheaper, like pennies on the dollar for most cables. But that does come with a cost. And that has been lots of the cables that are advertised aren't exactly what they say they are on the tin. Oh, they're they're not actually up to the same spec that they should be. Yeah, and Amazon has finally decided to start cracking down on these. Um, this came to light because of a uh, rather industrious uh, Google engineer wanted to find a USB Type-C cable for his new Chromebook Pixel. Now, if you're not familiar with it, USB Type-C, that's the brand new connector, the one you could flip either way to plug in. It has a lot of cool features, uh, much higher data throughput, and higher charging capacity. Which means your phone or your other device, whatever, charges faster, and you can transfer data back and forth like that. And Instead of going, no, well, I'll go make a soda. And you, can go, also, make a soda. Yeah, and you can also charge things like laptops via USB-C because it has the capacity to do it. However... The more uh, volt that you push through a cable, the well, more current you push through a cable, the hotter the cable gets. So if it's got this extra capacity, in theory, that's 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 not the problem that happened. Oh. He bought it. A, could be. He bought a USB Type C cable on Amazon, and the cable 
Not only was it missing the extra wires that were necessary to actually make it a USB Type-C cable, two of the other wires had been transposed. So it was not only a crippled cable, it was a crap crippled cable. There was a power line, there was a power wire on a data uh, pin. Fry, he bricked the pixel instantly. Ouch. So this guy had made a little crusade of going on Amazon and raiding Type-C cables and bringing it to Amazon's attention and, and making some waves about it. So Amazon is now going to start restricting and cracking down on them. And if you try to sell something that is not what it says it is, you risk run the risk of getting booted off Amazon if you get complaints about it. It's, and this is going to start becoming an issue. Yeah, it, it's this is it's it's not even just a cheaply made cable; it's a wrong cable. But this does happen a lot. You kind of have to trust the you you have to find safe sellers, and trust they are doing what you know what they're doing properly because. You get this flood of junk coming out of China with, that's completely unregulated. It could be any fucking thing at all. You've got to be careful with this shit. You, and yeah, I'm telling you at home, if you buy your cables online, you've got to be careful because you potentially run the risk of burning up your entire fucking computer with this shit. Yay! Yeah. So it's nice that Amazon is cracking down on it. I, I give kudos to them for, you know, trying to make this a little bit easier on the rest of us. I just, I, I have to imagine that guy's face, though, when he plugged in that cable and suddenly, poof, all the magic smoke got let out. Is that how you describe it? All the magic smoke? There is... I, I, that, that, is that, that is how computer, for those of you who don't know, that's how computer chips work. They contain magic smoke. If the magic smoke escapes from the computer chip, it doesn't work anymore. <laughs> there is, man, there is nothing more disheartening than working on a piece of electronics and hearing... <laughs> it's not really... They're not... The only time that's a good sound is when you're working on a bug zapper. <laughs> not a good one when you're working on, you know, actual computer it's not it's not really as tremendous as it used to be when they used to have fuses and um and circuit breakers those make a lot of noise i have uh, my, my um my tube amplifier that i work on sometimes i pop fuses on that thing before wow that lets you know something's broken well computers it's not it's just sort of like a and then it's done oh one of my favorites was Okay, now we're going to turn it on. Huh, lost power to the entire building. <laughs> hey. Oh, a trip for the circuit breaker is fun. Oh, we didn't trip the circuit. We tripped the building power. <laughs> the entire building power. What did you plug in? I didn't plug in anything. An electrician shorted the ground. <laughs> it should have gotten the circuit breaker. It didn't. Wow. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> Shorting to ground and the entire building dies. Lovely. All right, well, now that we've covered the news, it's time to cover your questions. If you have questions for me and Mike to potentially answer. Oh, God, you got huge again. I didn't touch a thing. It's reversed. I got huge. Hang on. Um, who the fuck knows what's going on here? Extremely close and incredibly loud. How's that? It's better, but smaller. Go away. Get back. Personal space. Personal space. <laughs> Normal view. Normal view. Well, if, you, if you're going to do it, then I'm going to do it. 
Now we're both that? doing it. Okay, that's better. Ish. Esque. There we go. That's better. Is that interesting today? Anyway. The train went by. Maybe that caused something. <laughs> it was the train that did it. Sure, Mike. Sure, it was the train. All right. If you have questions for us here, send it to request at radiodeadair.com. We will attempt to answer them for you. Um, let's start off with a question from EGC. So, screen inputs. VGA, DVI, HDMI, display port. Should I give a damn about what screen has for input options in general, or does it only matter for the Uber 4K gaming experience and stuff like that? Do you see it being better to get a screen with more modern input standards as a way to avoid it suddenly become obsolete, or is that still far in the future? Okay, if you're getting a screen that just has VGA, I feel bad for you, son. Yeah, don't do that. Okay. Don't do that. Let's break these down. VGA. Sucks. <laughs> that was the old video standard. It stands for Video Graphics Adapter. It followed CGA and EGA. CGA was Color Graphics Adapter. And EGA was Extended Graphics Or adapter. Expanded. No one really knew. It was just the, it was the EGA. VGA became the industry standard for probably a, the better part of a decade. And that was what gave, first gave us 16-bit colors. I yep, know. yep. Um, video graphics adapter, it's the big, chunky blue plug. You, you've probably seen this on a lot of older uh, hardware, and even some newer hardware. Yeah, I actually just disposed of a bunch of those cables at work, which, and, which did raise a question then. Why is the cable only blue, got a blue plug on one end? And like, I don't know, I'm sure there was a reason for it. Um, VGA is function, it, it, it works. It's okay. But it does have limits. It can't go past certain resolutions. Um, what's, I forget what the resolution limit on VGA is. Uh, but it's fairly 24 by 768, I believe. Yeah, 1024 by 768, which in modern standards, is fairly low. It's way below 1080p. Um, I think the upper limit is like 720p. That's about the upper limit, or and that's even kind of below. So VGA, oh, 1600 by 900. Yeah, it's it's not great. Another yeah. problem with VGA is it's an analog signal, which means analog means interference, which means radio and goofy and... You, you, put, you put your speakers too near, it can mess up. It yeah. can mess up your speakers, it can mess up your uh, video signal. I don't mean mess up as in destroy, necessarily, but distort. Distort, yeah. It, it's, it's, it's pretty much useless in the modern era. Yeah. Um, uh, unless you're working with really old legacy consoles and things like right. that. Right. Um... DVI was the next iteration to follow. DVI goes all the way up to close to, it doesn't quite go to 4K, I don't believe. I think 2K is its limit. I believe so, yes. Yeah. Uh, DVI goes up to a 2K resolution. Um, DisplayPort will go 2K with one plug and 4K with two plugs. Yeah. And HDMI will go 4K. Now, realistically, I would say don't get anything that doesn't have at least an HDMI port on there, because yeah. then you're going to be future-proofed. Most often, what you're replacing with computer parts is not the monitor. Monitors, since we've gotten to flat panels, don't die nearly as often as CRTs did. Um, but what it, with, with HDMI and DVI, a lot of confusion comes in. Originally, DVI and HDMI had the same resolution outputs. In fact, they pretty much had the same pinouts they were the same cable, except with different plugs. The big difference initially was that HDMI also carried audio. As time has gone on and the HDMI standard has evolved, it now has, like you said, it can do 4K on a single cable. That's HD, we're at HDMI 1.4, I believe. I think so, yeah. Yeah. As HDMI has evolved, it's actually expanded its capacity. And the neat part about it is most of the time, uh, the cable itself doesn't, the cable is m not always, but most of the time future-proof. It's mainly a firmware change or a hardware change on the things you plug it into. The cables can last a good long while. DisplayPort... Unless your cat gets to them. Yeah, unless your cat. Fucking cat. 
Um, oh, yeah, and HDMI can do Ethernet as well. That's some crazy shit. DisplayPort is kind of the odd man out these days. Yeah. It, you still see it on a lot of business end computers, um, but that's about the only place I see it with any regularity. Yeah, it's it's not really kind of, it, as as in terms of getting accepted as a standard, HDMI is kind of one. Now, there are um, Thunder port, there's the, the Thunder Thunderbolt Thunderbolt ports, um, and as well as USB 3.0 can do just graphics now as well. We might see an uptick in that as time goes on, USB-C ports, but for the moment, HDMI is king. Yeah. So in terms of what port should you get on your monitor, if you just make damn sure it has an HDMI port. Yeah. Now, I wouldn't worry too much about 4K video necessarily. It's still relatively expensive, and not a lot of games are taking advantage of it. Um, and unless you really insist on watching all your TV in 4K, I wouldn't worry about it there either. I do think this is the year 4K gaming is about to explode. Have you seen the stats on the GTX 1080? Yeah, or I've at seen least it. on the Pascal. Uh, but I'm going, no, I can't afford that. Yeah, well, you can't. But this is where it's going to start. This is the ground floor. We're going to start seeing 4K monitors become a thing after because now we finally have a graphics card. Or at least we will soon. I saw the stats on the Pascal. We'll finally have a graphics card that can handle 4K at a reliable frame rate. Ooh. Ironically, it's funny that the GTX 1080 will be the 4K gaming car. Yeah. <laughs> little irony. People, will says, is DisplayPort the Betamax of display output? No. Because I Betamax, was going to make that comment. I was actually going to compare it to Betamax. Go ahead, go ahead and say it. Go ahead and so say I, was, it. I was going to say that, but uh, uh, I would say it is. Well, no, but, because Betamax was superior to VHS. Oh, well, true. It's the other way it around just, in this case. It just didn't get, any, it didn't get any share. Yeah. In this case, HDMI is superior to. So. It's, it's the Betamax in that it's losing... Market. Oh, yeah. it's losing. It's losing ground. It's it's the DVD HD. Let's put it that way. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, DVD HD. That who that died quick. <laughs> what well, was the DVD format where you you would rent it and the disc would go bad after? I forget. Oh, they yeah. tried so many things. So many things they tried. So many things they failed. All right. Let's see. Next one comes from Josh. Um. Hello, Nash and Mike. First, let me say I really enjoyed the program, working in the tech industry myself, but not as long as you two have been. I really enjoy your insight. It's about time for me to upgrade from the tower I have now. Served me well, but after costing it out, it's better for me to upgrade from what I have. I'm looking for something that will allow me to edit video and occasionally play some modded Minecraft and Gary's Mod. Do you think I can get away with a tower that has an i7 processor and 8 gigs of RAM? Now, we, we'll get to it here. Not, do you I, think? I would say yes. But you're more looking at what your video card's going to be. That's yeah. But let's see. He what it comes down to. I know to stay away from Acer. I do not want an HP. Okay. This comes from Josh. Josh, first off, if you know anything about technology, you know the first rule of a desktop computer. Roll your own. Do not buy off the rack. Never buy off the rack. Now, I, I know it looks, if you've never built a computer before, it looks scary and intimidating. It will take all this time and no, no, no. Well, for one thing, there are a lot of really good how to do it tutorials that are fast, simple, and easy. Uh, Newegg has great system builder videos they put up. Mike, you got big again. Um, <laughs> is that a camera in your pocket? You're just happy to see me. Um, I didn't get huge, though. No, you didn't get huge, but you got bigger. Um, computers, the problem with getting them off the rack is that you have to deal with components inside which are proprietary, which means that if you buy an HP PC, some of the parts in there 
you can only if anything ever happens to it, you can only get from HP. And if you want to replace them later, like for example, if you want to replace the motherboard later, you have to buy a new motherboard from HP because only HP motherboards and a specific HP motherboard will fit in that specific case. Uh, also, they have various they have power supplies, which we've covered before. Some of them may be weird, wonky proprietary sizes, which you can't get anywhere else. Honestly, it is never, ever, ever a good idea to buy off a rack if, you, if you're trying to get a computer. You can build it yourself and for much less than you would spend on an off-the-rack computer. Now, understand, of your budget, if you want to be all legal and shit, $100 right off the top you're putting aside for Windows. You have to buy a licensed copy of Windows, so take $100 out of your budget. But that leaves you with a $600 budget. You could easily get a system with an i7 processor with 8 gigs of RAM like you're talking about. In fact, 8 gigs is kind of the standard these days. Uh, you, could, you could move up to 16 without batting an eyelash. Um, an i7, 16 gigs of RAM, a good mid-grade video card like uh, GTX 7 or 970 or a 960. A GTX 960 would do you just fine. And that's in the $120 range. Mike, you've blurried. What the fuck? You're in a Coldplay video, Mike. Um, yeah, so in general, go to Newegg. Newegg's a great place, great store. They are your friend. They have wonderful how to build your own PC videos. You will save a fuckload of money and you will be able to easily replace anything in your computer if it ever goes bad or you ever need to upgrade. If you get the, I have a, a, a good computer case, most modern computer cases, they'll last you a decade because yeah. they haven't really changed motherboards. Yeah, go ahead. Were you going to say something? I said, no, no I, I agree. I say yeah, a good computer case will last quite that long. Um, and because you're not buying into HP, Dell, whoever else is out there, Gateway is pretty much dead at this point, aren't they? Oh, yeah, Gateway's history. I think um, Best Buy owns Gateway now, I think. Uh, you're not locked into not just their format, but their their posts. Because they'll, they'll do screwy things where they put the mounting posts for the motherboard in odd places. So you can't just go with the generic. It's, bu but, it's utter bullshit. Yeah, but you go with a, a brand like Cooler Master or someone like that. Yeah. Uh, and you can put any pretty much any motherboard in there of the right form factor. So it'll say... Fit some other board of this type form factor, and maybe, maybe there's a list. Now, the only downside of building your own is you are your own tech support. Yeah, no warranties. You have well, you do have warranties. Yeah, the warranties on the parts, right? But as far, but the, but another upside there is if you build it, you actually learn how things work together, and you get an idea of how to fix things yourself. So right. it's it's a nice trade off in the long run, like I did. You end up saving yourself money. I haven't had to take my computer to get it fixed in 20 years because I keep building my own. Um, yeah, same here. It, it is a much more cost-effective solution. I would recommend you look into that job. I can't really recommend an off-the-rack computer because another problem with off-the-rack computers is you don't know what you're getting inside it. I'm not talking about yeah. the processor. I'm talking about the motherboard. It could, yeah, they, they, it may have a, for example, let's say you buy Dell. It may have a Dell label in there, but Dell may not have made that board. They probably did. It's, it's a Foxconn board or... Or uh, it's... Yeah. E-Rock. It's some, it's some brand you've never heard of that has gone, we've made 10,000 of these. The first 5,000 get a Dell label slapped on them. The next 5,000 get an HP label slapped on them. And you don't know what components are on it. You don't know how it's put together. It, 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 they're cheap. They're baited, they are bulk cheap motherboards. And motherboards are critical to your systems because they link everything together. You want those whereas, to have. Yeah, whereas if you go with a brand such as uh, like Gigabyte. Well, lately they've been kind of iffy, but your okay. point stands. I, I bought mine a few years ago when they worked. Yeah. Um, but if you go with a, a well known, uh, well recommended brand, uh, then they've got generally 
good components because they go through and they quality control test everything. Yeah. Um, and they probably go, well, these components didn't pass. We'll sell them to Foxconn. Yeah, and the other thing is power supply. Everybody overlooks the power supply. Power supplies in off-the-rack computers are pieces of shit. Yeah. One and all. They are cheap. They are not knocked out in bulk, thrown in computers, and they are one of the things, when I was actually fixing stuff for, for Dell, one of the most constant failures on computers, power supplies. Now, part of that may be in it, that in a lot of computing environments, office environments, the power supply is not properly ventilated. Hmm. But that is just something that exacerbates the fact that power supply is crap. That was one of the most annoying things of doing on-site repair when power supplies died. People were like, well, what, what made it die? I couldn't just say, well, because it's a bulk piece of shit from China that Dell just grabbed at the lowest bidder to put together these computers. I had to say stuff like, oh, well, geez, you don't know. These things, they go out all the time. Could have been maybe a power surge in your building or could have been, you know, maybe a lightning strike nearby. I don't know. These things, it just sort of happened. Did, did you do the, the accent? Sometimes. When I was feeling frisky. Sometimes I would do it. Solar flares. Oh, yeah, them solar flares can not catch a power supply like ain't no tomorrow. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, don't you know. Cattle oh, mutilations are up this year. <laughs> so, yeah, again, get back to the point. Do not buy an off-the-rack computer. It's just and and you, so you're looking to spend around seven hundred dollars. You can get a pretty good computer, building your own for seven hundred dollars. Much better than you could expect to get buying one, which is the sad fact of it. Parting it out yourself, it, it's yeah. Now, personally, I would take that seven hundred dollars as your budget and add an extra hundred. So when you price things together, you can go when you're pricing things out. You go, 700 is my firm limit, but 100 is in case I go, oh, if I spend $10 more here and $10 more here and $10 more here, I get much better stuff or much bigger stuff. You know, you get, you go from a, 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 a case you really like, a case you sort of like to a case you really like for an extra $10. Also, Newegg has bundle sales, which are nice. Yeah, yeah. Um, and things like that. Um, the one thing I would look for in a power supply when you're buying this stuff is is modular cable systems. Oh, that is such a that, that, that'll save you so. Not every eggs. not every power supply does it. Just yeah, just a thing to toss out there. Yeah. In, as part of this question, All right, our next one is from John. He's asked got some questions regarding my net, network setup to stream video files from my computer to TV. Now it's a little bit of a long run. I'm going to try and condense it here. The setup is as follows: I have a home computer connected to my router via ETH. Yeah, Cat6 Ethernet cable. My TV has a SumVision Micro 4 mirror cast receiver hooked up to it via an HDMI cable. It's sort of like a little Roku. Mirror cast okay. allows you to, it's sort of like Chromecast, only for everything ish. Lots of things support mirror cast, only some things support Chromecast. Um, okay. He says it's working fine overall. However, when he tries to do anything over 720p, it starts getting stuttery. He wanted me to. He wants to know if there's anything he can do, except he cannot hardwire it. That's not an option. Okay, my first question would be: Is the mirror cast that you're using uh, 2.6 gigahertz or is it 5 gigahertz? It's or whatever. It's 802.11 BGN. Hmm. 150. That's the, that, I think that's the fault. The fault. Is. I think so. Yeah. Yeah, the, the SunVision Micro 4, I looked up the, uh, the parts on it. Um, let's talk a little bit about 802.11. No one here knows what the fuck 802.11 is. Even me, I kind of know what it is. You'll see this a lot on wireless devices. It'll say 802.11 BGN8 slash C. Great naming scheme, guys. A Great. slash B slash N slash I. A couple of them, okay, many of them are how much bandwidth it has, but a couple of those numbers are not bandwidth related. They're security features. Yeah. So, um, what those, what 802.11 is the universal worldwide Wi Fi standard. It's what, when people are building wireless devices, it's the guidelines they have to follow to make those devices compliant and work with other 
wireless devices. The letter after it, now this is completely counterintuitive, I don't know why. The letter after it designates not only it, uh, bandwidth and security updates and other updates. Uh, one of the earliest commercial models was 802.11b. Then there came 802.11g. Yeah. Whole bunch of letters missing. And then N. N. Whole bunch of letters missing. The latest iteration. The latest iteration is A slash C. Uh, no. The latest iteration. Well, hang on. The latest iterations are A H and A J, which are coming out this year. Okay. Well, the latest currently available one is A slash C. How the fuck is anyone supposed to, anyone in the real world supposed to follow that naming scheme? We went from B to G to N to A slash C. What the fuck are we doing this in, Welsh? And so uh, what happens then, though, is that device you have, which is, what was it called again? Uh, the Sumvision Micro 4. Okay, so Nash, what... Uh, which which of the beta two eleven standards does it use? N one fifty. It uses N. Okay, so N is limited in bandwidth to either twenty or forty megahertz, which may not be enough for anything over seven twenty. Mm. AC, on the other hand, has twenty, forty, eighty, and one sixty options. Yeah, I think the the failing in your system, the reason why you can't stream to your TV at, at greater than 720p is because you're being limited by that mirror cast, maybe by your router too. Yeah, because you don't tell us what router you have. Yeah, while 802.11, while all the devices, no matter what letter they have, will work with one another. If you hook up, let's say, an 802.11... G uh, wireless device. If you take one of those and connect it to an 802.11 N router, it doesn't suddenly go faster. It's limited to G speed. You're limited to the speed of the earliest iteration of whichever device is connecting. So if you have a G connecting to an N, you're limited to G speed. If you have an N connecting to an AC, you're limited to N speed. And don't get me wrong, N is pretty good for most things. Yeah. Uh, high high resolution streaming, not necessarily one of them. Right. Um, so you say wireless is wiring isn't an option. The only other option here, you have two things to do. Number one, I look at that Sun Vision Micro Four, it's kind of a junk thing. Ditch it. It's a junk gizmo. There are newer ones that are cheaper and better that work with 802.11 AC. I know telling you to spend money doesn't fix your problem, but there is no fix for this. You're, yeah, there's not a software fix, at least, we right. can use. But also, or a hardware or settings fix, firmware. Right. Also, check your router to make sure it's at least AC. Well, it should be AC. For N, N would handle it. A good N router. A good N, a higher end N router. But I would look at AC. I mean... Nash and I pimp out the various routers on a regular basis here. Asus. So. Asus. 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 We don't know how to say it, but we like it. The RT AC 66U is the one I use. Yeah, I use I use an AC router as well. It's 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 a very good little device. Uh yeah. It's very, very solid. The only problems I've ever had with it is uh, when a roommate has unplugged it in such a way that it caused it to lose all its settings. And I'm not sure how that happened. Magic! I've unplugged it plenty of times without doing that. Um, so yeah, at the end of the day, John, your, your best option here is you're going to have to replace some stuff. Uh, I, you, when you see these wireless devices and you think you're getting such a deal, you've got to read the fine print because you get what you pay for. And if you want it to be able to do all the latest things like High definition streaming and wireless distance and the range and and being able to, to work without interference, you actually have to pay for that because lots of these companies will just they flood the market with these cheap gizmos that don't work as well as you expect them to. And, uh, yeah. 
Um, P.S. Say hi to Grady for me. Grady, hello. Oh, my cat fucked off, so. Good, because he was screaming. He does that. He either screams or he fucks off. I don't know why. Probably because you're not paying attention to him. But if the door's closed, then he goes, oh, well, the door's closed. I'll go do something else. Um, finally, we have one. Because he, he only really screams at you during the show, right? Yeah, and, and no, during the day, too. He'll just come up and he actually will climb up over here while I'm doing so. Just very stealthily. Get behind. He will scream directly in my ear. I'll just be like typing along and all of a sudden I'll hear behind me. Ah! Right in my face. I'm like, really? Did you want something? And I reach over and he runs away. He's and he's like, play with me. He's a little shit. Um, finally, we have a question from Melanie McLaughlin tonight. Uh, my question is for my fiance, who's currently got his A plus cert last month. How do you both stay current on your skill sets? And do you have any recommendation for staying marketable as an IT professional who is new to the field? Um, well, I'm just A plus. You, you, you're Microsoft, aren't you? I have Microsoft. Yeah. I don't actually have A plus, even though I do a fair amount of hardware stuff. Yeah. Um, uh, I just, I, I don't have any specific method I use. I have job requirements that I have to maintain certain amounts of training hours for various certifications every alternately one, two, or three year blocks. But the way they all work, I can double and triple dip on them. So I take one course, it counts for all three certification continuous learning things. So I would just say find, find courses that interest you that count towards uh, job requirements or personal improvement goals. Uh, you know, take take the, the training course or whatever for the latest Microsoft uh, OS. There'll be, there'll, be, there'll be questions on there on the exam. I'll guarantee you right now, there are questions on that exam you will never, ever use in real life and the reason you won't use them in real life is because if you're in a situation where you need to use them, you will look up the answer on Google. It, with, with most reputable companies, they will actually... Now, I know a lot of people freelance and contract these days. Most reputable companies will pay for you to take certifications and require you to keep your certifications updated. Um, if you're on your own, not so much. Even for A+, plus, I'd say the best way of doing it is you learn by doing. You learn yeah. by, by every day keeping current, reading news. Um, I, I'll every day, if you're in the tech industry and you want Check to- Check Ars Technica every day. Ars, read Ars Technica every day. Read The Register every day. Read TechCrunch every day. Those are those three solid websites to go to. Stay involved. You will. What happens is you'll read a story. You'll hear some tech term you don't know. You'll get curious about it. You'll Google it. You'll learn more. And you'll and learn. You learn. And you get. You'll run into people asking in relatively short order if it's made the news on one or more of these sites. Someone at your job will be asking about it. In, yeah. Like I say, relatively short order. What you honestly want, especially if it involves a security breach in your field. You 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 want to keep going. With tech, if you want to keep learning and learning and learning and learning about tech, it's by doing really. There, there's yeah. no all of us just sort of kind of stumble into it. Yeah, now A plus is done by CompTIA, right? Yeah, CompTIA does A plus. Microsoft so, obviously handles same, it. same as Network Plus, same as Security Plus, right? Uh, if they have the A plus, I would suggest as a next step, Network Plus or Security Plus. My personal preference would be Security Plus, it's like Network Plus on steroids. Um, it's a better course. You, you, you do all the stuff you would do in Network Plus, maybe not in, in depth for some of them as you would do in Network Plus, but you get a better sense of the security side of things. And security is huge right now. So, um, And then CompTIA has continuous learning uh, available through them as well. You know, I've never really dabbled with Linux certs. How, how... Okay, so... I, I, I don't have any Linux certs. I have heard this story, which I've had confirmed more or less by people who have taken it. They can't go into details because of the NDA you sign when right. you take your exam. But from what I'm told, 
is when you go to take your Linux cert exam, they sit you in front of a computer that doesn't quite boot up. And you've got to correct the issues with its Linux boot. So then you can log into the machine and take the test. So you've got to get the machine working in Linux before well, you can take the Linux test. How, that's, the, that's the first part of the exam. Linux is, it's good to have, if you can, if you know Linux, if you know Linux well, it's good to have that one under your belt. Because like, yeah. like we said at the start when we were talking about Bash and Windows, the underpinnings of the entire internet are, are Unix and Linux. If you know <laughs> Linux, you can work with Apache. If you know Apache, you know basically the source code of the interwebs. Yeah. It's good at least, I would say at a minimum, to know how to troubleshoot Linux mm -hmm. uh, common functions. You know, if someone's saying, hey, this is happening, do you know what causes this? To, to be able to go, that is a disk mount error. You know, the disk is not mounting or the file system's not loading. It's things of that nature. The, the things that a common user might encounter. So, yeah, I, I, I think that pretty much covers the best advice we can give on those sorts of things. Um, just understand, when we talk about certifications for the technical field, they cost. Yes. They cost monies. They are not cheap. They're a couple hundred dollars a pop. If you can get your employer to reimburse you for them or to pay for them up front. Uh, where I work, I've mentioned this, I work for the government. Uh, they will pay for it up front if they have enough people to take the course up front. If I say, oh, well, only three people signed up for this course, that's enough, not enough to get a trainer out, they'll let me take it and I get reimbursed after the fact. But I have to fill out a stack of paperwork. And another thing is, if you fail, you still got to pay. Yes. They don't now, give you your money back if you fail the test. Some of the exams will allow you one free retest, but not all of them. Not, all not even exams. most of so, them, I would say. Yeah, check on that because you when, when you go in to take one of these, make sure you are ready. Make sure you've studied. Make sure you have polished yourself up because otherwise you are throwing your money away if you have not prepped yourself properly. Agreed. All right, I think that's going to cover it for this week. Like I said, um, next time, if you have questions for us, send those to requests at radio.air.com. Mike and I will attempt to do it. Mike, thank you very much. Sure. Good night, everybody.